to manage the landscape, the Aboriginals call upon their longtime ally, fire. Local authorities used to condemn their behaviour, judged too dangerous, but today their position has turned. They have understood that traditional patchwork burning comes from good knowledge of the landscape. We make fires to encourage the growth of food plants, like bush tomatoes. We make fires to encourage the growth of green grass so that the kangaroos can eat. The country becomes new from the blackened earth. Controlled patchwork fires are also a good way to reduce the quantity of combustible matter that ignites when lightning strikes, creating devastating fires. Spontaneous and intense bushfires burn out all plant life, whereas traditional burning often spares the active cells. Specialist in the ecology of bushfires, Dr. Robert Boyd has studied patchwork burning as done by Aboriginals. Where fire has not struck, flourishes a desert plant called Spinifex. Spinifex grasslands, uh, they occupy the driest, hottest, most extreme environments in Australia. To enforce their domination, Dr. Boyd suspects Spinifex produces an allelopathic chemical substance, meaning one that poisons or suffocates other plants in the vicinity. They are able to suppress uh, other plant plants from growing. A spinifex can reach the height of two metres, a diameter of five metres, and their roots have been found as deep as 30 metres below the surface. Their stems can become so hard they can pierce the reservoir of a vehicle and so dry they can ignite in a flash. Just below the soil surface, there can be up to 20, 25, 30 even different species of plant uh, existing as seeds, just waiting for the right conditions uh, to, to happen. When you get a fire come through in these spinifex grasslands, the, uh, the spinifex grasses are killed and all of a sudden there's, uh, the competition is removed, there's a nutrients released in the ash into the soil, uh, competition for water is reduced and when the uh, rains come along, these other plants are able to uh, germinate and grow. And so uh, all of a sudden the desert becomes a, a garden. Aboriginals harvest the grassy spinifex seeds to make bush bread. When necessary, they set fire to the plant to free the soils from their suffocating domination. High intensity fires cause a lot more soil heating and uh, seeds of um, all these plant species that are existing in the soil, uh, under these high temperature conditions, a high proportion of them are killed off and there's just no food around for Aboriginal people to, to eat. So fire and humans really go hand in hand in uh, spinifex landscapes. I think this seed has been cooked by the fire I think it's dead. The fire was too hot, or this was too, too close to the surface. Despite the chaos of a tormented colonial past, the Aboriginals have kept their know-how. It took over a century for the value of their savoir-faire to be recognised. Today, scientists are interested in the knowledge the Aboriginals have acquired by living in the desert for 40 or 50,000 years. In a struggle to better understand their deserts, the Australian government started the Bush Blitz Project, 
a vast wildlife inventory program. It is estimated that three quarters of the 750,000 species of the continent remain unknown. We're going to be working in one of the most remote areas of Australia and also one of the most extreme environments in the world. Each team will be issued with a survival kit, satellite phone to take... An expedition of 20 scientists explore the heart of the Gibson Desert. Their base camp is set up at Kiwikura, the most remote Aboriginal village in Australia, now an Indigenous protected area. The scientists are counting on some of the elder members of the community to help them. Josephine and her family were amongst the last Aboriginal nomads. She remembers the true science of the bush, one that her parents taught her. Survival in the desert may require a healthy body, but it would be impossible to exist without an intimate knowledge of the bush. So he just walking? And you yeah. grab Australia has many different species of lizards, and many remain unknown. Vent length is 245. So we take a little bit of the tail for a tissue sample. Yeah. This specimen is a blue tongue lizard, still a juvenile. In the desert, survival can depend on a lizard that you know how to catch. The scientists are also studying entomophagy, or the use of comestible insects as a food source. The aboriginals eat the larvae of beetles, honey ants and witchetty grub, which is the larva of a moth. When it gets a bit dry and so on, and they have trouble finding kangaroos or lizards and so on, they can rely on these. And they are full of protein and some very uh, good fats. Western science recognises one species of witchetty grub, but the Aborigines recognise many, and I suspect there could be a you know, number of species across the central deserts. There could be 20, 30 species. Working with the Aboriginals is, is it's really, uh, it's humbling in a lot of ways because they know how to survive here, they know how to find food where, there's, where we think there's no food. We don't see water, they find water. They, they're resourceful, um, they're brilliant at tracking animals. This is their land, they're, they're part of it, they know how to live here. And you kind of feel like a child when you, when you come to a place like this and you see how adept they are and how little we know. During a helicopter flight across the Gibson Desert, the scientific team discovers a lake that is not on any of their geographical maps, nor any satellite image. The whole zone is abundant with life in this unbelievable oasis. The last thing I expected was to be standing in water in the middle of the desert. Isn't that brilliant? This island of plants bubbling with life, set in a landscape scorched by the heat, gives a deep feeling of unreality. It shows that life persists, even in, in places that you think are unlivable. It brings you hope, you know, you just have to wait for the rain. 